This bow exercise is great to do as a warm up before your scales and really helps us understand the shift of balance that's necessary in the hand from frog to tip as we draw a complete bow stroke. First I'm going to talk about how to do the exercise, then I'll elaborate a little bit more about its benefits and uh, how I found out about it. So first we start by putting our bow on the middle two strings at the frog and we want to use more or less flat hair if not just slightly angled back like we mostly play. Um, again we start at the absolute frog with our arm as low as we can get it, our wrist as low as we can get it, the bow in the back of the hand and our shoulder as down as we can go. We start with our first finger hovering just above the stick and as we draw through the whole stroke we're going to drop our first finger and then start picking up fingers in the back of the hand one at a time until we're at the tip and we're only using our first finger and thumb. When we return we're going to start dropping our fingers one at a time until they're all down and at the very, just before we're at the very frog, we're going to lift our first finger again. I'll go through the exercise a few times, checking to see everything is low. Raise my first finger, drop it, pinky comes up, ring finger, second finger. I'm at the tip, only my thumb and first finger are engaged. I'm going to return to the frog. I'll drop my second finger, drop my ring finger, drop my pinky, and lift my first finger just as I'm approaching the frog. exercise is putting all your fingers down like a normal bow grip and simply just feeling that shift in balance without actually removing your fingers anymore. So maybe checking at the frog and at the tip to see that you achieved the right shift in balance, that you weren't continuing to remain in, your, in one posture as you go through the entire stroke. Or if I went with one posture through the whole downbow stroke, if I didn't shift my balance, I might end up here. So I might check at the tip to see if I can easily get rid of these fingers. As I come back to the frog, I might check to see that there's not any unnecessary weight or pressure on my first finger. One more time, the exercise. And once we do that a few times, we just go back to our normal bow grip. And we just feel that shifting balance. So why is this important and why is it so valuable and what sort of problems might it solve? Um, well, one common thing I see in a lot of students that first come to me, um, you know, they might have an extreme uh, posture in their bow grip that's either far too pronated or leaned over to the first finger, which I suspect might be the result of learning a bow grip from a violinist who's teaching the school orchestra, which is probably where they got their first 
sort of ideas about how to hold the bow and we very much appreciate people doing that kind of work and exposing kids to music and it makes sense that it would be a violinist because most of the kids that are in the orchestra, the string orchestra, are young violinists. Mm -hmm. Most kids play the violin, you need more violinists in the orchestra. So it would make sense, but I, I noticed that uh, oftentimes there's a bit of a violinistic approach to the instrument and the bow grip as a result of that with a lot of students that I get. Um, another, and this was I think when I was a kid, I was more in this category, uh, if your bow is far too far back in, in your hand and you never get to a posture that functions in the upper half, <laughs> Oftentimes I'll notice students that have this posture will avoid the frog. And of course they'd avoid the frog because it's kind of uncomfortable to carry the weight of your arm all the way until the strings are right under your hand. It's not really smooth and it's sort of awkward. and. It just feels a lot better if your bow grip is like this and kind of stuck like this. It feels a lot better to just be out here. Uh, same is true with this extreme bow grip that never changes. Uh, you'll kind of use the lower half. By the time you're at the tip, it kind of just turns into this. You don't have any leverage. So um, this, bow grip, this bow exercise works great for uh, cellists at just about any level. Uh, maybe a an absolute beginner it would find it a little bit challenging to coordinate all this but certainly if you've been playing for a year six months eight months um, it's something you can explore and it's something I even do before uh, scales um, just to explore that range of motion um, for me you know making sure that my bow is is really when I get to the frog, as often as I can, I'm dropping my arm, I'm flattening out my wrist, I'm dropping my shoulder. Um, at the frog is really when we have time to relax our arm. If we're playing a whole movement of a concerto, a whole movement of a sonata, uh, or a long piece in orchestra, we're playing lots of half notes. If you're not dropping your arm at the frog, your arm's going to get tired, and your shoulder's going to start burning. And I think every cellist is familiar with that feeling of playing uh, Canon in D at a wedding and feeling that, you know, seven minutes into the piece, your arm is tired. And it's no wonder, because if you were to stand like this for seven minutes, your arm would be tired. But if all you had to do was stand like this for 10 seconds, and every nine or 10 seconds you had one second to relax, you could probably do that indefinitely. And that would be the goal in using the bow, that we always return to that position at the frog as often as possible to get that moment of relaxation. Um, same deal at the tip. It's easy to be sort of happy with this, but we really get a lot better leverage at this point at the tip, especially if we need to play loud. far back in the hand or one that's mainly pronated. Um, it's about being able to go from one posture to the next throughout the bow stroke. Below in the description I'll link a video. Uh, it's one of the cello talk videos, David Finkel, which sort of inspired me to get some of these videos together. Um, he talks about an exercise that I don't even think involves putting the bow on the string, but it's one where it sort of deals with the same thing. He brings up the idea that, well, it can feel very far to be playing at the tip of the bow, and it can also feel sort of difficult to return all the way to the frog if we don't have a lot of time to do it, and sometimes 
we may not use as much bow as we'd like to. Um, this is sort of a psychology trick, but what he is telling you to do is pretend your bow is infinitely long and explore the range of motion of an up bow and of a down bow that's well beyond, well, while keeping your bow straight, of course, as much as you can, how far can you reach in either direction? And maybe doing a few as if you're drawing the bow. After a few of those, the tip of the bow, or the frog, depending on what your issue is, doesn't feel very far away at all. <laughs> feels like about half as far as you could go if you really wanted to. And it just makes the bow feel a lot shorter. It's almost like using a batting donut. If you ever played any Little League as a kid, you put the weight around the outside of the bat and swing it a few times to take the, bat, the donut off, and you go up to bat, it feels like your bat just is full of helium. It feels super light. So this is the kind of the same idea as far as, but just as applied to range of motion. And um, this exercise deals with that just in terms of the leverage necessary to draw the bow. So lastly, how I discovered this bow exercise was, uh, was shown to me by a friend. I was uh, in a degree program about 10 years ago and sort of a practice buddy of mine, Paul Axman, who's now uh, in Helsinki playing uh, in the orchestra and the opera. He's a bass player. And we'd sort of uh, we'd practice room buddies and, you know, we'd perform things for each other that we're ready to play through. And I was playing this uh, Piatti etude for him, uh, Piatti II. This, uh etude through and uh, he sort of noticed that my bow wasn't really straight all the time and that it was kind of causing the sound to be sort of in and out, defects in the sound. And he asked me to do this bow exercise. Now he's a German bow player, but um, he went to some master class and is a French, French bow style bassist that uh, he, he observed and this is where he got the exercise. I don't really know who that guy was or maybe Paul knows, but uh, so I don't really know who to attribute this exercise to, but I found it to be very helpful not only in you know doing the exercise to focus on the bow being straight, uh, but also it reoriented my grip, my bow grip. And uh, as I did the exercise, my fingers just sort of fell into certain slots, and they sort of stayed there for the last ten years. So I'm very happy I found this exercise. It took me from sort of a higher bow grip a little more pinched to one where I'm a little deeper on the stick and I, I feel I have a lot better control over over my bow than I did and um, also in, in watching some YouTube teaching videos I've, I found a bow grip exercise which I'll also or a bow grip video which I'll also link in the description along with David Finkel's video this is a video from Chris Campbell he's a teacher at Interlochen and he, he discusses uh, the points of contact and the issue of the thumb uh, with the bow and it's really concise and uh, I show it to a lot of my students and um, it just happens to be the bow grip that um, was basically taught to me by this exercise the same points of contact and I've never had a lesson with him or anything or met him but um, I guess we use the same bow grip so take a look at that as well <laughs>